Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In this video we are going to talk about re-entry, which is how a spacecraft comes back to the surface of the Earth through Earth's atmosphere in a blaze of glory. Well, hopefully not too much of a blaze of glory. Uh, we want the spacecraft to come back down, incurring minimal heat, though it will incur heat, there's no avoiding that, but a safe amount of heat is what we're going for here. So not too steeply through the atmosphere, but also not too shallow, such that it will go around and pass, have to pass through again. Now, unless the spacecraft is only passing through Earth's sphere of influence, in other words, it's coming from another planet or something, uh, it will come back into Earth's atmosphere. If it's coming uh, from another planet and fails to capture into Earth's orbit, then it might not pass through the atmosphere again. But let's say it's coming back from the moon and then uh, hits Earth's atmosphere, then if it skips out, it will actually hit Earth's atmosphere a second time because it's still in Earth orbit. But uh, yeah, we don't want it to do that because that's a dangerous sort of situation. And the spacecraft would be uh, on internal batteries. It doesn't have, I mean, sometimes it might have fuel cells, but a lot of times it won't. So yes, we want to make sure it doesn't run out of the electric charge or anything like that. And therefore we want to get down as quickly as possible. So uh, here is an Apollo command module. It is shaped like many capsules are, but there are variations. And the idea is uh, down here we have a heat shield that will take the brunt of it. There are multiple different kinds of heat shields, and so let's just talk about that for a sec. This is an ablative heat shield. Ablative means that the material is meant to actually peel off, and that peeling off allows it to dissipate the heat. So all the heat hits it, it gets charred, it falls off, and that sort of takes away the heat from the structure. So it's meant to uh, just go off, and we lose the ablator and this charred ablator and stuff like that. Uh, so the upside is it's simple, uh, but the downside is that not very reusable. Okay, and then another option is heat tiles. This is like on the shuttle. And sometimes heat tiles can cover the side of the capsule, and these are uh, more complicated. But they don't peel off or anything, uh, so reusable. Uh, but part of the more complicated is uh, some replacement necessary. So a few heat tiles will have to be replaced, depending on exactly how everything works. So that's the heat tiles. There are other ways of capturing into the atmosphere. Uh, you could manually slow down, but that act hasn't actually been done. These are the only two that I think have ever actually been done. So we'll stick to these two for now. And as far as these two are concerned, the heat tiles have been done by the shuttle and stuff that is similar, like uh, smaller space planes. And then capsules generally have the ablative heat shield and the key to how we decide whether we're coming in too steeply or not is something called the ballistic coefficient. Ballistic coefficient. And here we will assume that we have a surface like this that has got to hit the atmosphere flat. So the atmosphere has come in, in like this first. I will talk about how we tilt the capsule in order to modify lift later. But we're assuming that we're hitting the atmosphere like this, and then we can simplify uh, this situation to, we want, we want the mass of the capsule. And here I'll call it capsule, even though uh, is, uh, some people like Michael Collins did not like that. <laughs> he insisted that capsule was only for medicine. But anyway, uh, mass of the capsule divided by the area of heat shield. Very simple. So you get the area of the heat shield. Since it's circular, uh, that means that we just do pi r squared to get the, the, the area where r is the radius of the heat shield. In something like Kerbal Space Program, we normally talk about the diameter, so you'll have to divide that in half. But uh, mass of the capsule divided by area of heat shield. Uh, anything with a similar number, a similar ballistic coefficient, uh, coming in at the same speed should aim for the same height. 
So if you've tested a capsule that has a certain ballistic coefficient and it captured safely at a certain height, uh, the height is the periapsis, the point at which we are entering Earth's the low point that we enter Earth's atmosphere at. Uh, if you've got something that has a certain mass over a certain area, and then you have something else that has a similar number, it might be quite large. Oops. It might be quite large in uh, relation to this. Maybe it's like twice as large, but it has the same relationship between the mass and surface area. It should come in uh, at the same height. And so if the bliss, I'll uh, abbreviate ballistic coefficient as BC. If the BC is uh, larger, implies that the periapsis should be lower. Okay, so you want to bring the periapsis lower if the ballistic coefficient is larger. That means you have more mass on less surface area. Okay, and then at a certain point, you won't be able to bring it into the atmosphere safely because it keeps getting lower and lower. And when the periapsis gets lower and lower, you get hotter and hotter. So a lower periapsis means more heat. And at a certain point, it's not safe anymore. So what do you do? Well, you have a few choices. Um, so troubleshooting. <laughs> troubleshooting. If you are coming in too hot. If it doesn't seem you'll be able to capture unless you aim for a lower periapsis, then you can reduce the mass of the capsule or increase the area of the heat shield. Okay, so you're going to have to make it wider if you want to carry the same stuff. And so the Apollo command module we see here is quite wide as far as capsules are concerned. I'm going to clear all this right now. So taking a look at it, it's got these sides, but if we compare to the Dragon spacecraft, the Dragon spacecraft is like this. It's uh, The Apollo command module is only meant to accommodate three people. The Dragon spacecraft accommodates was designed to accommodate seven, but it also has its launch escape system built in, which is different from, from the Apollo command module, which had the tower that separated and took the launch escape system with it. So this has launch escape system and service module fuel built in, so that's another reason why it's so much bigger. But because it's bigger, if we take a look at the mass of the Apollo command module here, it's six tons. The mass of the Dragon capsule, however, on basically uh, a similar heat shield area is 9.5 tons. So let's uh, get some sample here. So this is six tons. And the area will be pi times r, which is about two squared, so it's about uh, 4 pi. And then uh, this one is 9.5 tons over the same, basically, same area. So, yeah. Uh, so this one is going to have to come in steeper than this one in order to capture. However, the Apollo command module is designed for the moon, designed to come back from the moon at 11,000 meters per second. The Dragon capsule, however, only need, needs right now to come back at low Earth orbit velocities. So let's say 8,000 meters per second. So the velocity is different. And the greater the velocity, the lower the ballistic coefficient should be. So we have a low ballistic coefficient here. This ends up being a lower number low ballistic coefficient, and there's a higher ballistic coefficient, but it's okay because in this case it's only coming back from low Earth orbit. Here, this one is coming back from lunar, uh, the lunar orbit, so or from the moon. So if we want the Dragon capsule to come back from the moon, and maybe it's safe, but it would have to be verified that it's safe, but ideally we would want it to be wider. So that would, or we could make it lighter. That's another option. So. Uh, that's the idea. The faster you're coming in, and it's very sensitive, by the way. Uh, for instance, the altitude that I normally aim at for with the Apollo command module is 58 to 60 kilometers. For the Dragon 2 coming back from Earth orbit, it's 70 to 75 kilometers. So there's a 3,000 meter per second difference between the speeds that they're coming in at but the height difference is about 10 to 15 kilometers. So 
the difference in what the right height is to minimize the heat ends up being very fine-tuned. This is much more important for Mars than for Earth because with Mars, coming in to Mars from Earth, it, you have to capture, otherwise you're going to get flung out into interplanetary space. And so you're going, uh, sometimes you don't have to use Mars' atmosphere in order to capture. You might capture using propellant. But if you are using Mars' atmosphere to capture and you're entering Mars' atmosphere to do this sort of uh, aero break, in that case, we're talk we I'll define that. Uh, aero capture, actually. Aero capture. Using the atmosphere to capture into another planet's orbit. And in this case, this is critical because, like I had said before, this is the only time where if you don't manage to uh, get into orbit, you will get flung out into interplanetary space again because you're using the atmosphere to capture into orbit. You must do it. And so the altitude is critical. And in that case, it could be a matter of one kilometer off that if you get down to the right altitude, you will capture and you will be safe with the heat. Or if you don't get to the right altitude, you won't. And so the ballistic coefficient calculation is much more critical when it comes to arriving at Mars, if you're doing the aero capture, uh, than it generally is around Earth. Uh, with Earth, the more important thing is that you are properly heat protected. With Mars, you really need the ballistic coefficient to be very good and your altitude to be right for that ballistic coefficient. So calculating all this out and getting data on what the right height for what ballistic coefficient is, is critical for Mars capture. Okay, but let's talk about how we actually do it. Uh, and I've still got the Apollo command module in orbit around the moon, so we'll bring it back and we'll see how that works out in practice, if you will. Okay, so here we are with the Apollo command and service module in lunar orbit. So we are in orbit around the moon still, and we need to get back. We have more fuel than we ought to have, actually, and that's because in, for the demonstration, I had cheated the spacecraft into orbit. So we actually should have uh, maybe 1,200 meters per second left, and we only need about 800 or so uh, for the actual return. Uh, so if you're budgeting your delta V for that, you're looking for maybe a budget of 1,000 would be safe. And we want to, in exiting the moon's sphere influence and leaving the moon's orbit, we will directly aim for the correct periapsis around the Earth. So we're not going to do two burns or anything like that. We're going to do everything at once right away. And the location for doing the burn to leave lunar orbit is dependent on which way around the moon you're going. So the main thing is that you want to make sure that your, your path out, your trajectory, is going to be going opposite the moon's orbit. So the moon's going this way, and so you want to go that way. Uh, and if you're going around clockwise, which we are doing now, so this is a retrograde orbit, goes around clockwise, you will do the burn at about 1 to 2 o'clock, right around here, if 12 o'clock is the moon's own path. And so right around here is where we will do the burn to exit. If we were going around the opposite direction, counterclockwise, uh, we would do the burn over here. And so in general, when it comes to going into a lower orbit, which we are doing, we are going into a lower orbit, the location for doing the burn if you're going clockwise is over here. And if you're going counterclockwise, it's over here. So the upper end here is if you want to get into a lower orbit. And the lower end here is if you want to go into a higher orbit. That's good enough to remember. And in this case, we are going to be increasing our velocity with respect to the moon. And uh, the yellow line indicates how it is while we're still in the moon's sphere of influence. And the purple line is out in Earth's sphere of influence. And this is our Earth periapsis, the low point. We must get that into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere begins at 140 kilometers, so we're way too high right now. And so we continue increasing the speed that we're going at until it's low enough. And you can see it's sort of deviating from directly out, but it's close enough that I don't mind. It might be a little bit more costly as far as the delta V is concerned, but it's okay. 
And I said that I like to get to about 58 to 60 kilometers. Uh, let's just try 60. And I'm just fine tuning it here. But it is very touchy and you know what, we can just, well that's good enough right there. So there is our burn and we have to wait in orbit to do it. If the timing ends up being wrong, you'll have to do a correction of some kind. Now in this case, being too heavy doesn't hinder our re-entry because all of our fuel is in the service module and we're going to dump it. However, if our re-entry spacecraft carried its own fuel inside its own body, remember that mass is critical. And so if it was carrying its own fuel in its own body, let's say like Dragon does, uh, the Dragon 2 in particular, uh, in that case, then we would want to dump some of the fuel in order to lower our ballistic coefficient and lower by lowering the mass. So keep that in mind that in this case, the fact that we're going to dump this service module and not bring it in, the heat shield is over here. Uh, so that means that we don't have to worry about that too much. Though obviously they couldn't uh, stuff too much inside the pod, there is a limit for the ballistic coefficient to be what it is. So when you think about, we'll talk about the space shuttle in particular in a bit because it's peculiar in its shape and the way it re-enters. But the reason why it has limited mass coming back down is because otherwise it would have too high a ballistic coefficient. Okay, ignition. So going up, the space shuttle could carry 25 tons or so. Coming back down, it could carry 12. Okay, I've cut the burn a little bit short, and that's so that we can fine-tune using the RCS. And so we've got a periapsis of 148 kilometers. I'm just going to use the RCS a little bit to move that in. Okay, and that's close enough to 60 kilometers for me. And in real life, of course, there were orbital per perturbations that they couldn't necessarily figure out ahead of time. And so they would do corrections on the way back. That's not going to be true here in Kerbal Space Program, uh, at least like this. So we are not going to need to do any corrections. We are just going to head out. So they would reassess the orbit to see if they really were hitting the altitude that they exactly wanted. And they would tell the crew, well, we need you to do this burn in this direction to correct it. Also, another key consideration was... The, making sure that they came back in the right location, right? Because there are ships waiting for the crew capsule to pick up the crew capsule and they need to be in the Pacific Ocean or something close to the recovery fleet and all that business. So those calculations have to be made and they'll finally tune the orbit to make sure that that's happening. Uh, for us, we can just head straight in because I don't care where we're splashing down. Uh, if you want to do all that work, that's going to take a lot more planning. Uh, because you can see Earth turning right there as we come in. And so hitting a particular spot with this uh, rather uh, takes some NASA-like in ingenuity. And you could do it, especially in Kerbal Space Program where we don't have the orbital perturbations. You can do it, but uh, it's got to take some work. That will take serious planning. And actually, there's the United States right there. Uh, we're ending up in some forsaken location where we're not going to be picked up, right? Probably. Okay, so uh, at a certain height, we need to dispose of the service module. We want to be as low as possible because once we do, we lose the fuel cells in this case. The fuel cells are in this. And so we are no longer gener generating power. There are no... Uh, solar panels up here. If your spacecraft has its fuel cells or solar panels on its re-entry module, that's fine. But in the case that you don't, it's very important that we wait as long as possible to jettison this so that we are not reliant on the spacecraft's own internal batteries for very long. And again, that's another reason why we don't want to skip out. Okay, so we're going to point normal. And this is so that when we jettison the service module, we do not hit it. Because <laughs> uh, both are going to be slowing down. We want it sort of off to the side. Uh, all these things, by the way, are things people had to tell me at some point, right? I mean, none of this uh, is like some natural born knowledge or something like that. 
So eventually somebody had to nag me into doing these things. I ended up doing them properly. And we're gonna be talking about something else people nagged me to do uh, in a moment. But let's get rid of the service module. Okay, so that is off. Now, the other thing people nag me to do is let's get uh, the orientation right. And we want to uh, activate the RCS on this. So this has its own thrusters, but we only use it at this point after that is separated. Hopefully, uh, by the way, the service module in real life had its own controller and it was able to move itself away, but this doesn't have a controller in it apparently, so we can't move it away. In real life, they could. But anyway, we'll ignore that for now. We want to make sure that our rear end is pointed uh, in the direction of the airflow. And in other words, that the spacecraft is oriented retrograde with respect to the surface. So with the little X marker there. And we uh, here we turn descent mode on. Now what they would do in real life is they would make sure that the center of mass is in the right place. And it will be offset from the direct center line. It will be just a little bit offset, not a huge amount. But in the Apollo uh, audio tapes, when you're listening to their missions, you'll hear the mission control telling them where to place items, literally, uh, to make sure that the balance of the spacecraft is right. And so they'll say, stow this in this location, stow that in that location, uh, to make sure that the balance is just right, so that the center mass is just a little bit off. And the reason for that is so that they can do a lifting re-entry. Mercury, the Mercury capsule did not do a lifting re-entry. It was purely ballistic, which means it is purely, um, just like we calculated a ballistic coefficient, uh, hitting the atmosphere directly with the arrows hitting the heat shield uh, like little spears. Uh, so, but the Apollo command module and the Gemini spacecraft and other command modules have an offset center of mass so that they can do a little bit of a lifting re-entry, not as much as the space shuttle does. The space shuttle really does a lifting re-entry. These can do a little bit of lifting re-entry in order to control where they're going to land and also to make sure that they capture properly. So we'll discuss how that happens. And this is something people have to tell me how to do. And so I'm thankful and everything. But the key is actually roll. Um, because when you have an offset center of mass, and we do that with this descent mode thing. Um, when you have an offset center of mass, you can either have the offset, let's say up here, or you can have the offset down here. And what that's gonna do is it's going to tilt the spacecraft because uh, it wants to have the center of pressure line up with the center of mass. So where the airflow is hitting the heat shield needs to sort of line up with your offset center of mass. If the center of mass is directly center, it'll go right through like this. But if you have it up here, then the airflow wants to go like that instead. And so that tilts the whole spacecraft. And then, unfortunately, we're gonna be in the dark. Let's uh, pump up some ambient light, perhaps. Vacuum in. Okay. Uh, and then if you have it lower, then the opposite, it's gonna tilt the other way. So it basically becomes sort of an airfoil-ish kind of thing where the air is going to hit it, but then glance because it's tilting. So it'll glance off in one direction or it'll glance up. So if you tilt more like this, it's sort of, sort of tilted a little bit. And so it'll glance off like that. But if it's tilted the other way, it'll push the air that way. If the capsule is pushing the air down, it gets lift and therefore makes the reentry more gentle and sort of stays at a higher altitude for longer. If it's staying at a ha higher altitude for longer, it's cooler. It's not getting as hot as quickly. But then you're having a risk of skipping out. So tilting the other way than we are tilting right now and pushing the air up will force us down quicker. That'll be higher g-forces, but it'll ensure that we don't skip out. So the tilt up and tilt down is to uh, manage the the location, the landing location in this direction, but they can also sort of slightly go side to side as well, right? It doesn't have to be just um, zero or 180 on the roll. It could be some angle. And then so if they angle one side and they push the air off to this side or that side, they can turn the capsule even. And so they can actually control where they're going to splash down in this direction as well. We won't worry about that. <laughs> That's 
uh, I don't have a particular landing location anyway. The key thing for us is to make sure that that apoapsis uh, comes down and we eventually make sure that we do capture, uh, th that we do re-enter fully. So we don't go around again. So right now we're in this orbit. We want to make sure that it comes all the way down and we end up splashing down on this try. Otherwise what's going to happen is if that doesn't come all the way down, we are going to end up going around again, probably in a smaller orbit like this, and hit the atmosphere again. The Apollo Command Module could do it, but again, it's all a matter of electric charge, battery power, uh, so we don't want to risk it because we might end up losing power in the meantime. It depends on how big the orbit is. It normally shouldn't be that bad to skip out, even if it did happen, but just in case. You can see 11,000 meters per second as we are just entering the atmosphere now. And if you do have this offset center of mass thing, you don't want the uh, the control system to be holding the pitch and yaw, but we have to wait until we are deep enough in the atmosphere that the atmosphere is having an effect on the pod. Then the atmosphere will orient the pod properly. Um, we will see that some pitch is being used here, but it's not much right now. But as more pitch is being used, we can just turn that off. It'll, it, it always still tries to use it. But... So here's the tilt due to the offset center of mass. You can see it's very tilted, and we are pushing the air down like this to make the re-entry more gentle. But we are going to be concerned about making sure that we actually come down properly. Oftentimes they'll be inverted the whole time, so not like this, but the opposite way, just to make doubly sure, because the capsule could take it and the astronauts could take the g-forces just fine. But in case you need to make it more gentle, because let's say you have a heavier capsule on the same heat shield, right? Because you have a higher ballistic coefficient, then uh, if you have a higher ballistic coefficient, then it depends. Uh, if, if you're aiming for a lower periapsis, you might want to make it more gentle initially. Or on the other hand, if you are confident in your heat shielding, you may want to just go ahead and come steep. But I'm going to roll it over, or try to. Uh, this isn't working very well, so I'm going to manually turn it. So I'm manually rolling it to 180, and this will ensure that we capture. So now it's a little bit more intense, but we already c cut down our speed a bit, so that's good. If we hadn't cut down our speed a bit, it would be very intense, but you can see we're already going up, so that's not great. Let's see if I've done this in time or whether I should have done this earlier. This might be a good counterexample at the end of the day, we'll see. I think I was too late rolling over. But you can see it's moderated the uh, speed at which we're going up. If I had done it earlier, it would have been better. This should still be safe. We have, I think, three hours of battery life. So we went from a four, uh, sorry, eight day orbit to a three hour orbit. So, we get to talk about what happens if you skip out. <laughs> so, what I should have done was probably keep this orientation from the start. We really didn't need the lifting orientation at all. And I think the command modules generally did come in just like this most of the time. But we're not in a super high orbit. You can see this is the orbit that we are in and our battery life should be good enough to sustain this. But this is not normal normal. But if you need to, it's possible. And this means that uh, the altitude, it was basically the altitude we wanted. If you don't have this sort of lifting re-entry thing happening and you don't have this descent mode and offset center of mass, then you would, if this happens, need to aim lower in the atmosphere, obviously. If we aimed lower in the atmosphere, even if I did this re-entry just the way I did right now, if we had, let me turn off these things, um, if we had aimed in the same location, in, in uh, if we had aimed lower in the atmosphere, we could have done the same exact thing with our roll position and it would have gone down. So, or we could have just done the inverted position the whole way and that would have brought us down. Either way would have worked. You can see that we've used some of our ablator and some of it has become charred ablator here, but we haven't depleted it. And actually, in real life, there's plenty of engineering margin on the ablator. After all, uh, you don't want that to mess up, so they, they make, a, make it a generous amount. So we are in, out, out of the atmosphere now. 
and we are in a low Earth orbit. Our electric charge is depleting, and we have skipped out, but we will come back down anyway. At apoapsis, if you are too high um, on the periapsis, so we're at our peak here. Uh, our periapsis, you know, I said 70 to 75 for low Earth orbit. Um, this is probably okay. But if we have the fuel, it's a little bit tight right now. We can sort of bring our periapsis down. Uh, but the RCS thrusters on this aren't great for that. <laughs> Because none of them are pointed in the right direction, so you have to be a little bit clever and rock around a little bit. Remember, the periapsis will be most affected if you do this at apoapsis, at the opposite end of the orbit. These thrusters are all oriented for roll only, really, uh, or pitch and yaw. They're for rotation, not translation. And so we have to play these sorts of games to puff one way or puff the other. To lower the periapsis. This should be fine. You can just rock it back and forth. This is an advanced technique. I'm not going to get into it. So our electric charge is holding out for this particular bounce out. And we want to reorient again. This time we have to make sure that we get the pitch and yaw in. And we do want to use the surface velocity, not the orbital velocity, because the surface velocity is how the atmosphere is. And so we want to be retrograde with respect to the atmosphere. Uh, how orbit is doesn't really matter when we're hitting the atmosphere. And once we see a, sus a substantial amount of pitch being used, we can turn that off on the Smart ASS. And I found that Smart ASS doesn't seem to like to roll this very much, so I'm just going to turn it off and use SAS at that point. Okay, so it's using quite a lot, and I'm going to just turn it off. Let the capsule naturally tilt down to its aerodynamically stable position. Do that early, though. Uh, definitely above 80 kilometers, because otherwise, when it over-tilts like this, you might incur some heating on the top part. We only want the heating on the heat shield. You can see it's sort of ro rocking back and forth, trying to find a stable point. Because we have no control right now. Uh, I'm not controlling it. You can manually control it. But we have a limited amount of RCS fuel in the pod, so we have to be judicious about that. See, it's uh, leaning away from... So can astronauts manually control re-entry? Yes, in fact, uh, that was part of the Gemini testing. Yeah, they did manually control re-entry once. Just in case they wanted to test that that was possible. Manually, though, does still mean that the inputs are fed through a fly-by-wire system, just like they would be on a modern airplane. But it wasn't purely computerized control. So here we're getting to high g-forces, more than four, so I'm going to roll around. Even though we're really, really hot, but the heat shield will stay pointed in the right direction because of how the aerodynamics is. So, one key thing I suppose we should point out is, make sure your center of mass is low. Uh, you can see the pod's shape means that its mass is predominantly on the heat shield side, right? Because it's wider here, it's got all the stuff down here. Whoa, roll that way. Uh, make sure the mass is low. If the mass is too high, it'll like turn over and go pointy in first. Having the center of mass low ensures that it goes heat shield in first. So when you design your spacecraft, make sure that. And with shuttles, the center of mass should be very close to the center of lift. That ensures that it can have an easier time pivoting. It shouldn't be too far forward and definitely not behind the center of lift. So, we are coming down. We are bouncing up a little bit because I wanted to moderate the g-forces and the heat. That's why we were oriented this way, but we are going to come back down pretty soon. We're going to stay in the atmosphere this time. The amount of heat that you get from the atmosphere increases exponentially with regard to your velocity. So even though the velocity coming back from the moon is about 50% more than that from low Earth orbit, the temperature, it, the actual heat is many times more, but that's complicated because no, uh, the, the the way the capsule is shaped, this sort of curve, uh, sort of creates sort of a shock. 
and the actual temperature of the heat shield is a little bit different than the uh, temperature of all the plasma and all that business. So that is there is a calculation for that, but that's probably beyond the scope of space basics. And practically speaking, you're not need, gonna need to worry too much about that as long as you have some experimental results. And we get a little bit more of this heating as we're getting to thicker parts of the atmosphere, but it's not that big a deal. And here we could just probably let the spacecraft roll around. It's not gonna make any difference. At this point, we would be splashing down where we splash down. Now, Apollo uh, protected its parachutes with an aero cap on top here, the sword heat shield, and so we have to release that first. That also gets rid of the docking port like that, um, the docking probe at least. And then we arm the parachutes and it'll come back down safely. There are other ways of doing that. Uh, Dragon does not have a forward heat shield that actually separates when it's deploying the parachutes. Orion does. Orion is much more like uh, the Apollo spacecraft like that. Okay, well, this is on parachute. I don't think we need to worry about anything else here. Let's talk about the space shuttle a bit. So here we are with the space shuttle, and the space shuttle is very big. In fact, if we bring out the Apollo command module, which we just saw, uh, you can see that the space shuttle can easily carry the Apollo command module in its bay. Uh, let us go ahead and put it in there. And it is heavier than the Apollo command module by quite a lot, but its surface area is more than what is necessary. And the reasons for that are that it has a very fine control over where it lands by necessity, but also by preference because it could have less surface area. It could have shorter wings. And the reason it has the large wings that it does is because of the requirement that they wanted it to be able to land very far away from its current trajectory. So during re-entry, it could turn and move its landing site to a thousand miles off of where it was originally going to land. And that helps. Uh, it's very hard to change your trajectory like that using fuel in orbit. Uh, changing inclination that much would take a lot of fuel. So if you can change your landing site like that on re-entry, that is a big benefit and it allows for different sort of missions and more landing opportunities. So that's why it has the big wings that it does. Uh, and, uh, because this is more than is required for the mass of the actual shuttle. Uh, especially since it's only coming back from low Earth orbit. But that also has other effects. First of all, it is very gentle on re-entry. It uh, can limit its re-entry to just two Gs, uh, as opposed to capsules which generally have more. It tilts up like this so that it can basically do the same sort of lifting re-entry that we saw with the command module just now and so it does push the air down. Can it go inverted? Yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, I don't think they ever did. Uh, that would be a very emergency sort of situation, but in theory it can. Uh, but I wouldn't rec uh, This was from uh, MIT uh, series of lectures on the space shuttle where they said that it could, so uh, that I'm, I'm quoting that. I'm not making it up. Uh, one of the designers of the space shuttle said that it could, but uh, we'll leave that for that. Uh, I don't think yeah, don't. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. But anyway, uh, so it comes in like this and pushes the air down, which means it gets a lot of lift. Now, the good thing is that that improves its ability to control its landing site. And as with the command module, it limits G-forces. So it's a very gentle ride down compared to other spacecraft. The downside is that obviously this increases its ability to skip out. So it has to aim its periapsis lower. So whereas for lower Earth orbit, I would normally aim for uh, 70 kilometers, in order to make sure that this actually comes down, they have to aim it lower. And normally it's zero or negative on the periapsis for this, just to make sure that it gets down uh, smoothly. Uh, so it could have a negative periapsis. That's not a problem because, again, it's getting lift. Uh, not that it's going to be a problem anyway, because during re-entry, your periapsis eventually goes negative very quickly. But... 
uh, it can, because of the lift and the fact that it hangs out in the higher part of the atmosphere for longer, the negative periapsis doesn't mean that it's going to have a whole lot of extra heat, right? If the Apollo Command module has too low a periapsis, it's going to have a lot of heat very quickly because it's not got as much lift. Because this has as much lift as it does, it stays in the higher part of the atmosphere longer. It sort of gets a little bit of a more vertical speed. It even bounces a little bit sometimes. And that allows it to cool off. And so the negative periapsis doesn't really hurt it very much. So, But there is a limit to everything. Uh, to everything, there is a point where if you come in too steeply, you are going to blow up. And you need to make sure that you don't do that. So the angle for the space shuttle was 40 degrees. This isn't exactly 40 degrees. They just sort of rolled around at the 40 degrees. So in order to control where they were landing, it was more a matter of going like this. So, yes, that's the space shuttle and other space planes. They come in like this. With the Starship, it comes in at a steeper... Well, in theory, will come in steeper like this. Okay, I think that's all I have to say about re-entry. I probably am missing quite a lot. Uh, we'll probably cover the Mars details when we get to Mars entry, descent, and landing. There's, there will probably be a video on that. But if you have any questions, please do mention them so that I know what to cover in the future. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.